Welcome to uh, another session of the Donahue Group. We're delighted that you could join us. Um, we're uh, talking today about all sorts of interesting issues, mostly at the state level, but I think we'll branch out here and there. Joining me is Ken Risto from the Sheboygan Area School District, Social Studies Instructor and Director of Curriculum. Tom Paneski, Professor of Math at uh, the University of Sheboygan, Wisconsin. Cal Potter, former State Senator, former Assistant Superintendent, Public, excuse me, former Assistant Superintendent for Public Education. That's not quite right. Close enough. But close <laughs> enough. My title, my title is close <laughs> enough, too. I'm just a humble lawyer, so yeah. my name is Mary Lynn Donahue. Um, talking about the state, state issues that are of interest to us, but the state came to Sheboygan a couple weeks ago when Governor Doyle visited. Cal, you were in the audience uh, at End Park, I think, my yes, own neighborhood. Yes, he ended his visit that day at End Park. I don't know how it was chosen, but it's a historic park. Um, and he uh, had a crowd, maybe about 75 people. Um, and he, the mayor was there, the county uh, administrator was there, a number of uh, local officials and labor people, as well as uh, just general citizens who some of whom were just walking by and said, what was this crowd about, and came in and <laughs> met the governor. Good. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a good uh, session. He had a number of charts wherein he uh, listed his vetoes and the impact of the vetoes. And I think the road show that he, would, that he took around the state was to show that his vetoes were to accomplish a goal. It wasn't vetoes for vetoes' sake, is that he wanted to put in several millions more in education because he said the only way that he can stabilize property taxes, which was his, his goal in another direction other than what the Republicans were saying as far as a freeze, was to put more money into local school uh, district aid. And he said he accomplished that particularly by uh, transferring some of the transportation fund into uh, schools. And of course, right after that, the uh, Republican legislators came out and said they wanted to freeze what or knock off 15 cents on the gas tax, uh, which then forced the governor to come out and say that you can't do that, I'm committed to the schools. And then they said, well, he shouldn't be diverting the money. And so the politics of sniping uh, continues between a Republican legislature and the, and the Democratic uh, uh, governor that we do have. But he basically uh, outlined his vetoes and uh, stated that his goal was to try to stabilize the property tax and support public education. And then he cited where the money went, uh, trying to at least uh, hold districts as harmless as he can, as well as put money into things such as student aid and so on, in light of the fact that tuitions have gone up due to the fact that the university receives substantial cuts in the budget as well. Right. Um, and it sounds like it was a pretty friendly crowd. I read anywhere between 60 and 100 people, depending on which newspaper account you read of the uh, of the event, and being an old organizer myself, I always count who's <laughs> who's present, and, and unfortunately, I couldn't be there. Sounds like it was a pretty friendly crowd, though. Yes, it was, and mm -hmm. he did have an opportunity for people to ask questions, and some did ask about the county nursing nursing home situation. Uh, several did, matter of fact. What was and, his answer? Well, basically, he says you're faced with a very difficult uh, situation. It's a local decision. Um, we had, don't have any more money for medical assistance. Uh, we try to provide more money, but we just don't have it. Um, and then he commended Sheboygan County as being one of a few counties that has nursing homes. And as a result, uh, you have an additional expenditure here in Sheboygan County uh, that you need to contend with and budget for that other counties do not have. And he said, I wouldn't, I'm not going to venture into that that debate because I know it's a difficult one. And that, in other words, he's saying uh, providing uh, nursing home care for people from a public sector point of view is something that he'd be sympathetic to, but he realizes the budget crunch that the county is under and how to balance the budget at the time you're trying to fund deficits in the nursing home area is a difficult. And he says, I, I don't know how I can help you other than, he said, I am going to very strongly lobby the federal government. He said, most of what I'm facing in the area of medical assistance is a cut in federal mm -hmm. monies. And he said, if I can and he did talk about how he is uh, part of, like, he didn't mention the number, but it, it's a coalition of both Democratic and Republican governors who are lobbying the President and Congress to provide more medical assistance uh, dollars because they're all faced with oftentimes very high cost patients and high cost uh, people because these are people, of course, who don't have money to pay their own medical bills and pay their own way. And as a result, uh, they could use additional help from the feds. Yeah. 
Well, and I think, and I'm sure in f future programs, we'll be talking more about the, the county nursing home situation because that obviously is going to be yeah. a very hot button issue. I mean, it is now, but as budget time grows closer, I think it's going to be even more, uh, more, pro more problematic. There was a lot of uh, hustle and bustle in the newspapers and on TV about the veto, Governor Doyle's veto. And um, there's been a suggestion that the American historical memory is about 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that would seem to account for the fact that Republicans now are terribly upset by the line item veto uh, that Governor Tommy Thompson used with such a flourish and with such enthusiasm. And um, the Democratic challenge back in, uh, I think 1992, if I'm not mistaken, might have been a little later, uh, to the line item veto was uh, put down by the Supreme Court, which found it to be perfectly constitutional, known as the Vanna White veto. Pick a number, <laughs> pick a letter. <laughs> what have I got here? Um, what are your thoughts? Good, I, good idea, bad idea? The line item veto. That's, it's constitutional. You go first. Yeah, you go first. It's you, constitutional, so. Defend Tommy now, please. I'll defend I mean, Tommy used it, the Governor Thompson used it, and Governor Earl used it. And probably, uh, not Governor Earl, but Governor Doyle. Mm -hmm. uh, and Governor Earl probably used it too. So uh, leave it in. Uh, the thing that the Republicans need to do if they are, don't like it is to get the governorship uh, next year around. And, and then they'll use it. Then they can use it. <laughs> and that's the way it is. And I'm, I'm the complete flip. I was appalled when the Republicans used it, and I'm appalled when the Democrats <laughs> use it. Um, I, you know, I'm an old political science guy, and I just remember something vaguely about legislatures having the power of the purse in our uh -huh. constitutional scheme of things, and not letting the checks and balances. Yeah, wasn't and, and, that just and, a quaint you know, old custom? I just really think it's time for a constitutional amendment to you know maintain a line item veto because there's been enough political studies that show that governors that have strong line item, some line item veto authority really do to hold down state spending. Uh, so I you know I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we give the governor the, the predicament the presidents face where you get these huge authorization bills and you got to swallow a lot of things that you hate. But when a governor can transfer money from a transportation to education even though it's a good news for me as, a, as an educator, um, and maybe uh, yeah, I just have some real philosophical problems with that, and I think it's time for an amendment. And it means, and I know, right now, right, I know right now the Democrats may not be happy about that, but there's going to be a governor, but it's going to be a Republican someday, and we're going to wish, we're gonna, then they'll be screaming for the amendment. It's time to stop this silly kabuki dance and get on with it. What, a, what kind of amendment are you looking for? Well, I, I think governors should be allowed to probably exercise, you know, take, take out um, certain line items in such a way that they can reduce spending in certain programs, but it shouldn't be, um, you know, the Vanna White veto where governors can, with creativity, move monies around from Project 1 or Program 1 or Department 1 to Department 2. It just yeah. doesn't seem to me that, 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 and I understand that when, you know, the Constitution was framed, the large authorization bills with everything in them and bag, grab bags was not what the founders, you know, envisioned. And uh, I'm sure that the Wisconsin founders who put this uh, line item veto together, whenever it was instituted, I don't know when. I don't think it was an Earl. I, I think it think started it with Tommy, didn't it? It's but been around a long time. But constitutionally, okay. I think I the Wisconsin the, governors it, had line item veto for quite some time, you know, yeah, even back to the progressive budgets, era. When I first came in the legislature, um, Pat Lucy's budgets were about 360 pages long. Uh, most common budgets today are maybe 3,000 pages. So yeah. they're just billions of dollars more and many, many more, more pages. Uh, so the verbiage that's available to play games with is, is tremendously more, ex more extensive. Well, well, Cal, let me, if I could ask, is that because uh, governments are spending more money in more areas at these pages? You know, we have go from 300 to 3,000, or is it because legislatures want to give departments less discretion on how they spend monies? Or is it a little um, bit It's both? a combination of things. A lot of it is that the budget bill is the only bill that needs to pass in a legislative session because it keeps the whole ship going forward. Yeah. Agencies know that. And so agencies that previously, when they had a, a program they wanted to advance, would put it in special legislation and have to do extensive lobbying, now throw it into the budget. The governor also knows that uh, you need to set your mark as a governor as to what you stand for and uh, so they, through the department administration, 
come in with everything from soup to nuts in their agenda and dump it into the budget bill. And then legislators know that uh, all the bills that they introduce, and there are thousands of them each session, um, that the budget train is the only one that's going to leave the station and get to a destination, so you throw your bags on it. And so they throw uh, a lot of their bills into the, uh, into the budget bill. So just through a period of, like I said, going from Pat Lucy in, in uh, the 1970s uh, to present time, a period of uh, 30 years, it just has evolved and, and, and blossomed into a, a really a, a mechanism that's, I think, overused for the passage of legislation. Uh, and, and a lot of it's justified because everything costs money. I mean, even if you have a piece of legislation that doesn't um, appear to spend money, the, the cost of assigning it to somebody and printing a document explaining what it is, there's always some money associated with everything you do practically in government. Sure. So it is a germane mm -hmm. uh, document. Um, you know, they, the people will say, well, there, there shouldn't be this in the budget bill because there's, there's no fiscal impact, but there is a fiscal impact. And so you stretch that and you stretch it to the umpth degree and as a result the budget bill has become uh, the major piece of legislation. And, and it's, it's, it's a shame because Things in that budget bill don't get the scrutiny they need. Exactly, yeah. and you know, yeah, and and that happens at the at the federal sure level, it does. obviously. Yeah. The only thing that saves us to some extent is a germaneness rule. I mean, there there is uh, in a budget bill there is a relating clause, and you always refer back to the relating clause in the federal government, there is no relating clause. You can dump everything in, mm -hmm. into, into there. That, and so the state, there is something about the expenditure of monies and the raising of monies to finance a program. So you do have to creatively, even though you dump everything in, you do have to creatively put it into the relating clause. So it, we're not as broad, what I'm saying, as the federal government that dumps everything into uh, fiscal yeah. policy budgets. Well, and somehow, in spite of all of our concerns and, and uh, squawking on both sides of the fence about all of this, the democracy does continue. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it is kind of interesting that the Republicans <laughs> are now putting forth a constitutional amendment to limit the veto power, which is something Democrats did when Tommy Thompson was in office. Yeah. Well, just remember, Emerson always said that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And so... Well, you I just what you lobby for. exactly because <laughs> you might get it. <laughs> Cal, how do you feel about uh, there's been some proposals also floating around uh, to end legislative sessions at a certain hour so that this morning, these morning votes that really don't get public mm -hmm. scrutiny, is that just do you see that as being effective after all your years? Uh, of I don't think it makes much difference because yeah. the only time you do go overnight is usually on the budget session, right? And it, it is a matter of you don't have the votes. And you do have a deadline of July 1 to pass a budget so that things continue, although you do what you do in, in essence is just continue under the old budget. But you do have everybody out there from social services to transportation and aids and school aids, everybody right. out there sitting with bated breath wanting to know what they're going to get because they're trying to formulate their own budgets on the local level and so on. So it is a tactic where it does get people eventually to say, I guess I can't put all my pork into this budget. I can't hold out anymore. So um, hindsight, yeah, there's no reasonable thing that occurs at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, no, it's not a good way to make sausage. But it is a way of finally getting finality to say, you do have a responsibility to pass this bill within a reasonable amount of time. If we tend to say that we're all gentlemen and ladies and we're all going to pack our tents up at 7 in the evening and come back tomorrow morning at 10, you probably would extend the last session for another month or two while people we continue to, to throw things on so, the train. So, you know. yeah, so this is one of the public benefits of sleep deprivation. Yeah, I think exactly. Well, yeah. well this is, I remember the, the, my first years on the, the school board. You know, we'd go till 12 or 1 in the morning, mm -hmm. and we, we tried, you know, meetings will not last beyond 9.30. <laughs> I mean, it just didn't work. Yeah. Uh, it, those are, those are kind of tough, kind of tough things. And, um, and again, the democracy goes on. Speaking of the democracy going on, voter fraud. Some interesting letters to the editor um, uh, this week on um, uh, voter fraud issues. Uh, Cal, what are your thoughts on it? Well, after the uh, fall uh, elections last year, uh, we had a number of accusations, particularly out of, emanating out of Milwaukee, that there was rampant voter fraud, uh, people voting who weren't even alive and whatever. To, um, as a result, there was a uh, federal investigation, uh, federal attorney Buskubik, who was appointed by a Republican, um, 
did take on an investigation and last week came forth with a, a, a decision that there is no rampant voter fraud, that indeed there had been some felons, um, I don't know how many, five, six, or whatever the number was, who had voted, who by law shouldn't have voted, but he just said it was just a system that's bogged down in old records and maybe inefficiency and understaffing and, and that there needs to be a cleanup, but it wasn't rampant voter fraud where people were trying to steal elections. It was just the nature of the beast that we have created or don't create well enough or fund well enough uh, that we need to fix. And I think uh, that's something I said right after that because sure. I've heard this for years that Milwaukee's got people on the list that aren't alive anymore. And what, when you look at sometimes the little old ladies that are working there at these polls or understaffed, the line is out the door. Um, they're not about to be uh, conspiratorial and trying to steal an election. It's the furthest thing from their mind. They're trying to get through the day in many cases. And I think that's true in Milwaukee and it's true in Sheboygan and it's true anywhere you go. And if a few felons voted, I guess that's wrong. It's against the law. But I guess we should chalk it up to say, well, maybe they re rehabilitated themselves uh, sufficiently that they're now participating in society, and uh, we should. <laughs> and that's maybe a good thing. There are people who are saying we ought to have uh, felons vote again because anybody who wants to vote and participate in the electoral system must have their head on straight, and maybe they've reformed themselves. There's still a number of uh, people in Texas and Florida, for whatever reasons, that are banned from voting is, is a very, very large percentage. Yeah. And they're having that discussion yeah. about at what point does a person pay their debt to society and can assume full citizenship yeah. rights. And in some states, um, this felon thing has got to be a joke. Because exactly. In Florida, they were, they were going to websites and finding convicted felons. Well, Tom Smith, there are probably 5,000 Tom Smiths, and many of them convicted felons, not only just in Florida, but they're in Texas. So people who showed up in Florida to vote with a certain common name or were denied voting because their name was on the list, but that was happened to be the Tom Smith in Texas, not the one in Florida. Well, and it's interesting, uh, as a user of the Wisconsin court access record system and the work that I do, I'm often typing people's names in to you know, check convictions and so forth. And I'm surprised even uncommon names, you type a name in thinking, yeah. without a middle initial thinking, who else yeah. could have the name of yeah. Hepzibar Schlerbeck, you know, oh, and that's correct. buy jinkies if there aren't. Yeah. You know, I've it, typed my name in and I've come up with several pages of people with my name, even with my same <laughs> middle initial. It's right. amazing how many people have your how name. How many speeding tickets you've had, right? <laughs> <laughs> thousands, absolutely thousands. Um, I've uh, been reading that uh, in terms of states that are going to electronic voting um, machines, that there is a stronger moving, uh, movement building to require uh, paper ballots or a paper uh, trail behind paper the copy. machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's even got an acronym that I, I can't remember and I don't remember what it stands for. But it's, it sounds like maybe we're moving in the right track with getting more efficient machines, but also having the paper backup that, that the Diebold company, I think, was, was, which was getting a lot of this work, was, was not interested in doing. And so. I think both sides can come up with voter system improvements. And I think if they put aside their political sparring and bickering, we can come up with a bill that says you, de you indeed need some identification and, and maybe two type types of identification, but not necessarily do you need to have a picture ID, which was something that some people said. There are people who don't drive. There are poor people who don't have a car. There are elderly people who lose their license because they are old. Now, why should they be forced to jump through certain hoops to get a certain type of ID card in order to vote? I mean, they've probably lived in their home for 40 years. They've yeah. got there's no causal you know, relationship between right. if there is voter fraud and having a picture ID. There's right. no there's no causal connection right. that 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 one solves the other problem. Right. So, I don't know. I uh, I it's a big system uh, and uh, and has to be taken care of. But I think so, people ought to be comforted by the fact that most of this is political rhetoric, that there isn't rampant voter right. fraud, things aren't working as well as they should. We ought to focus in on the logistics of how things don't work very well sometimes at an election day. Exactly. Ken, you were going to say? Well, so, so, I mean, in the letter to the editor, Senator Leibem, first of all, didn't really respond to the issue that the Democratic chair posed to him, um, as any good politician would. You know, don't respond to the charge, but move on to something else. But he did give, a, a, at least from an average person's point of view, a list of some real concerns about voting that went on in, uh, in last fall. 
and he's just off the mark? No, I think there are problems. I think Milwaukee, uh, if you look at the list, there are probably a lot of people there that don't <coughs> live at certain places. There are probably less addresses that are there that are now vacant lots. You know, they just don't have the staff, the time, or, or the system to have purged and updated and, and, and done probably what they had to do with their voter registration list. And again, there are felons who get on the list uh, uh, because there's probably maybe not a good enough communication between Department of Corrections and, and people, a little old sure. lady who was working in a poll in, in Central City, Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So well, there are kinds of logistical problems that ought to be addressed. And I think that's why I said I think both sides ought to sit down and see what they can do to make the system accurate and work well and not start saying, well, there's all kinds of rampant uh, uh, illegitimate people out there who are voting and they're, they're skewing the elections one way or another because that's not happening. It's just not a system that we can be really proud of. We ought to fix it and mm -hmm. make it better. Well, let uh, me. The, uh, the Democrats yell that the uh, their, uh, system is set up to keep uh, minorities and mar I would have put people who regularly don't vote off, keep them from voting. They always, you hear the arguments, oh, they've set up systems and they set up all kinds of uh, roadblocks so people can't vote. They've got long lines, people can't wait in long lines, so the Democrats keep yelling, 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 yelling. And so now, they're, and then the Republicans now are yelling voter fraud, so we got both sides. Uh, yeah, it all, because it's uh, where the power is. Where the power is, right. and I mean, I, I have read that, uh, like, People with uh, multi-residences, uh, some in one state and some in other states, there's documented evidence. That's in New York and Florida, people have sure. Florida homes. And, and, sure and they vote by absentee in one place and vote ballot in the other place. In a, in and, a general that, and that's probably impossible. Let's get off elections just because our time is running short. I wanted, I've got three educators, past and present, um, uh, sitting here with me. What are your thoughts about the education budget? Did Governor Doyle make good on his promise to keep education a, a high priority in the state, um, both at the, at, at the um, college university. and university level and, and, uh, and regular public education? I think happy, he did the best he could. I mean, mm -hmm. he only yeah. could take uh, the budget that he was given and not be able to write things in, but by line item right. veto, shift <clears throat> some money around. And I think he did the best he could. It wasn't sufficient to, to stave off, I think, some budget crises that are going to occur. Uh, the revenue caps are, are going to continue to hurt school districts, mm -hmm. particularly those with declining enrollments. Um, the QEO is a 10-year-old vendetta against the teachers' union that ought to be thrown out, but it's still there because there's still people who have a vendetta and want to put the screws to teachers because 70% of the budget is, is salaries. So I think uh, there's some bad public policies sur surrounding public schools that ought to be uh, looked at, but uh, monetarily, I think he did the best he could for public education. Tom, Ken? Yeah. Well, I mean, the university, uh, uh, loses faculty to other institutions because they don't pay the salaries. Then you have the other, uh, other part, the uh, faculty and administrators have backup jobs, so you think, well, how do you deal with that? Uh, oh boy, the university has just taken it on, on the chops yeah. here, <laughs> and, and, and you've got to ask yourself, what are these people thinking? Is this another bureaucracy that's been under a rock for a while and nobody's looked, or, or are we missing the point? I mean, I read this stuff and it's like, yikes. <laughs> yeah, and every day you read one, and I know they're, they exist in the UW colleges too, and I think it's just, I guess it's across the, yeah. the, the country that there's backup jobs. But uh, I mean, uh, there's a real crunch on finding uh, quality people to teach in the university. And because of the uh, reduction in uh, funds and, and then staffing, they put caps on staffing and stuff like that, and you, you can't hire the people. Yeah. So it's, we're funded, we, we'll make do, and we'll move on. Yeah. And tuitions are the way that the university is funding more and more of their operations. More and more, yeah. And, it's, and it is indeed hurting the poor. It is. It really yeah. is. I, I, I think that on, on the public university level, the gap between rich and poor is just yeah. is and, growing. And, and there are stereotypes out there that somehow those folks won't be able to garner the money. But when you're trying to pay, you know, you, you heat your light and just keep food on the table, 
um, coming up with thousands of dollars to go to school is a difficult task for a poor person. And I think yeah. a lot of people who have a means don't really know what it is to, to be in that position. Mm -hmm. you know, Wisconsin still, um, I was looking at a study the other day, Wisconsin still is I think, third in the country in making education affordable for average middle class folks, but you're absolutely right with with the way Pell Grants or with adjusted for inflation have mm -hmm. really, really gotten smaller and smaller and those are those monies are funded particularly for low income. And some of those statistics are yeah. antiquated. And yeah. the last two budgets have really socked yeah. it to students. Uh, we were, have been traditionally about seventh in the Big Ten in the cost of education. And I think last figures I saw, we were fifth and right. we may we're be moving right about fourth. Yeah. So we're, we've moved up into the middle of the pack in the Big Ten. Yeah. But the other trend that's more disturbing is more and more money is being moved toward giving scholarships to students based upon not financial need, but, mm -hmm. a, but, as, but, but their academic performance. Yeah. And I can understand why you'd want to give you, you want to give certainly recognized students who've done well in, in school the incentive when yeah. we're on our high school level saying, you know, there's money down the end of the road for those of you that play the game by the rules yeah. we've set up and, and excel. But uh, Wisconsin is, in, in that nationwide study I was looking at, uh, way down below in granting, giving monies to kids because of a financial need yeah. and who've shown academic promise as well. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to wrap up. Um, just It's come to our attention that we usually stay away from federal issues, but there's um, some federal legislation that is pending that we just wanted to touch on a little bit that cuts at the very core, the very heart of the Donahue Group, um, and that is proposals <laughs> which... <laughs> And it's probably not targeted just at our humble little program. <laughs> I was going to say. But <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Anybody, oh, that we would be, oh, that we'd be that influential. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think so. But there has been legislation introduced in Congress. Um, anybody want to speak to, and, and it's, uh, I have not had a chance to look at this in any great detail, but that um, has the potential of really eliminating public funding for local cable That's programs strange. like this. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, my understanding that it's uh, in, in committee uh, and may not come out of committee, but any comments or concerns on that front? Well, our viewers ought to know that this doesn't come free, that this studio and these cameras, uh, the whole providing of Channel 8, it comes from a franchise fee that the cable company pays to the city, for example, and the city then shares that money with the providing of local access uh, cable channels. And what the, the bill is basically doing is eliminating that franchise fee responsibility or albatross as the cable company would probably look at it. And uh, as a result, the funding would then be a competitive with everything else that the municipality has to fund. And I think you can all conclude that Probably Channel 8, as you know it today, would not exist if it weren't for these franchise fees being available. And it seems that public communication, public radio, public television, sure. is always up for, um, um, well, certainly substantial criticism, uh, political controls. Um, we enjoy our programming here quite a lot, and it would be it would be sad to see. I, my sense is Channel 6 or Channel 12 wouldn't be quite so interested, but. On that happy note, we're going to end, and uh, thank you. We'll see you again.